you can sleep during this lecture. My students do that regularly. If any of you want to take a nap, we won't uh, say anything about that. But it's fun to talk about Auraria, Denver's oldest neighborhood, the neighborhood where Denver really began. Auraria was actually founded in October of 1858, one month before Denver City was founded. So it is the oldest of all these neighborhoods today. And kind of an update on the 9th Street Historic District that Gabriel mentioned, there is a proposal now for an Hispanic Historic District uh, from Colfax to 13th, I think along Mariposa and La Pan, uh, celebrating the Hispanic people and the militant Hispanic movement that got started there. And Gabriel, we'll uh, switch us to the, thank you for guiding us through this. I love this uh, image done way back in 1858 over Auraria. It's hard to believe they had pinstripe tents like that, but this was an artist who was on the scene painting a party. And can any of you guess what the la label down there reads where it says KT? That would be Kansas Territory, which Colorado started out as part of Kansas Territory, part of Nebraska, part of New Mexico, and part of Utah. After the gold rush, they carved the state, or I should say the territory out of Kansas Territory. Okay, Gabe. And Gabriel, if you have any questions or want any clarifications, let me know. It's fun working with Denver history because you have images, photographs, and drawings from the very beginning. Here's that uh, year old town clustered along Cherry Creek, and you can see it's mostly tents and log cabins there. Okay. And this is the discoverer, a William Green Russell. He was from Auraria, Georgia. And as uh, Gabe pointed out, Auraria means gold. And Auraria, Georgia was one of the original gold discoveries back in the 1830s, uh, which led to the removal of the uh, Cherokee Indian who were on that site and quickly chased out when gold was discovered. Russell had mined there in Georgia. He'd also been out to California in 1849, 1850s with the California gold rush. So he was an experienced prospector that knew where to find gold by looking at the geometry, figuring out how the gold might have washed down from the mountains. Here he is outside of his cabin in what's now Auraria. This would be about the site of Elitch Gardens uh, today. And you can see a Native American woman there. Uh, they were often married to these very first pioneers and mountain men who settled here, uh, often married into the tribes. One of them, William McGaw, married in and, and claimed that he was related through his wife, and I think wives in his case, to Champa, Wazi, and Wiwata. If you wonder where those names came from, they were supposedly the uh, wives of these early mountain men. This was one relic left. You can find this in the basement of uh, History Colorado, uh, 1200 Broadway today. It's the McGaw Cabin. And it uh, was also supposedly the first hotel, the El Dorado Hotel. And here, after a fire, they found the original hewn log building underneath the clabbered. And this was pretty typical. You'd start out with a log cabin, and then particularly if women showed up and wanted refinements, you would put clabbered on and paint the uh, cabin. Okay. And here is Countess Murat, who ran this El Dorado Hotel to give you some idea of the shortage of women in the early days, when the census actually showed there were 20 males for each female, she was described as a beautiful, shapely woman who ran the finest hotel and restaurant in town, famous for her German cooking, her strudels and whatnot. The mother of Colorado, she's sometimes called as the first white woman on the site. Okay. And here's the discoverer, and I love to put these two photos up against each other because you can see William Larimer in the bottom picture there uh, is beardless. Abraham Lincoln is elected president. He has a beard, and every man seems to grow a beard after that in 1860-61. So you usually find uh, before and after photos. This is the case of William H. Larimer, who founded Denver City uh, November 22nd, 1858 and celebrated with that great beard. He also ran for mayor and then tried for governor of Colorado, was elected to neither. I think his problem was he was a, a strict uh, 
Presbyterian, as I recall, a non-drinker in a town of young miners who did like their drink and like to celebrate. They saw him as an old fuddy-duddy, as a preacher, did not support William Larimer. He gets a little bitter about it at this point and says, Denver's never going to amount to much, even though he had been the one to name it, and goes back east, gives up on Denver. He gave it the name Denver, by the way, for John, not, not John Denver, as my students seem to think, but James Denver, the governor of Kansas Territory. As we mentioned, uh, this was a part of Kansas Territory at that time. Larimer figured by naming it for the governor, he would smile on this and make it the county seat of Arapahoe County, Kansas, which was a pretty big county, all the way from the Colorado, uh, Kansas border uh, up to the Continental Divide. Here's Larimer's house, and like so many claims of the first in Colorado, or the first here, or the first there, you have to remember, were we first? No, there were Native Americans first. They had camped on this site for decades, and later on there are Hispanics who come in, so you have to figure in both of those people and discredit these claims for the first house uh, that Denver made for himself. Here's a look at Denver before the gold rush, what it looked like. You can see Long's Peak there in the distance, and the South Platte River here, uh, which uh, Stephen H. Long on his exploration of the South Platte River in 1820 called it clear, cool, and delicious. Have any of you tried drinking from the Platte River lately? It can sometimes be uh, cool, but I'm not sure it's clear and delicious all the time. And these were the uh, original occupants, the Arapaho Indian who camped on that site uh, for decades before the gold rush. This painting is actually pretty accurate. It's showing Cherry Creek flowing into the South Platte River. And if you look on the uh, east side of Cherry Creek, you see the Native American, the Arapaho teepees. They had camped here, as I mentioned, for years, for decades. It was a winter campsite for them, as I'm sure you're all aware. Uh, Denver in the winter is uh, milder than many places, certainly milder than up in the mountains, and also had water flowing year round. And you had uh, cottonwoods there for fires and whatever you needed wood for in those days. So the Arapaho would camp here in the winter, hunker down. Then as spring came, they'd head out on the plains hunting buffalo. And in the late summer, they do what many of us do, and that is head for the cooler mountains and uh, following the buffalo up there too, where they would be. And then when the first snow comes, oh, can you back up just one more, uh, Gabriel? Uh, then when the winter comes, the first snow flies up there in the mountains, they head back down to this winter camp at what becomes Denver City. Thanks, Gabe. <clears throat> Here is uh, Chief Little Raven, a drawing of him in the tent with the first white settlers there. He was the head chief for the Southern Arapaho tribe who had always camped on the site of Denver. And he said he found it a little funny in these odd wooden square shaped buildings that were near, nowhere near as functional as the teepees that he and his people lived in. Here's a better a portrait of Chief Little Raven. He was a pretty smart Native American. He actually escaped the Sand Creek Massacre uh, these people, remember, had welcomed pale faces, welcomed the white folks in in 1868, 59, 60, uh, 61. How do we repay the Arapaho and Cheyenne for their hospitality? At the Sand Creek Massacre, uh, six years later in 1864, where Arapaho and Cheyenne were slaughtered, something like 200 of them, many of them women and children and old men. Little Raven was smart enough not to camp right on Sand Creek but to camp a few miles away, he said he got lost and he survived to go onto the reservation in Oklahoma and die a peaceful death as an old man. Today, we finally honor him with Little Raven Street uh, in lower downtown Denver. This is a, a diorama at History Colorado. And if you haven't been there, it's fun to see these dioramas, very well done during the New Deal, the Great Depression when unemployed artists and architects and historians uh, were hired to put these beautiful dioramas up. This one shows Arapaho women erecting a teepee. And it's important to remember, we don't often remember that it was the Arapaho women who did this, designed the teepees, constructed them, peeled the uh, 
lodgepole pine leaves and then tie together. So they were the architects of these. They could put them up in half an hour. And if the uh, Utes were after them or they were in trouble, they could take them down in a matter of half an hour. Now, if you look closely here, you'll see that women are doing all the work. Has that dawned on any of you ladies? That women in any culture have done nearly all the work. This was certainly true of the Native Americans where the guys would shoot the buffalo and then the women would get to skin it, pull off that robe to help make this teepee and also trim the logs and put that up. As we mentioned, they could put these up or take them down in no time. There's one white guy sitting in the back, maybe you can see him, excuse me, not a white guy, but a Native American supervising these women. Uh, some criticize these women as ignorant squaws, as savages who really don't know what they're doing. But take a look next time you go at DIA, next slide you will see that that TP shape is now put to very good use at uh, DIA. It's half the price of a flat roof. It's actually uh, transparent, translucent, so you can read in there by natural light. It gets natural uh, heating in the, in the winter when it needs it. So maybe these women did have some idea of what was best suited for our climate here in these TP shapes. Uh, early map showing the th three settlements of Denver, Auraria, and Highland. That's the Platte River through the middle of this, and then Cherry Creek, the smaller stream going up. Uh, Highland or North Denver is on the north side, west side of the Platte River, and then Auraria, then Denver, the three original settlements. And by this time, if you look at the label, it's Jefferson Territory, uh, which is a brief lived uh, successor to Kansas Territory in this part of the world and predecessor uh, to Colorado Territory, which is uh, designated in 1861. Okay, this is our first school teacher, Owen J. Goldrick. He was an Irishman, claimed to have been to Trinity College and educated there, but nobody can find any record of that. And here he is being impersonated by Dennis Gallagher, who helps us out with this series now and then playing the role of Owen J. Goldrick at his tombstone in Riverside Cemetery. He had two oxen, Epimetheus and Prometheus, who responded, he claimed, only to Latin instructions, which he gave. He finds that first school building in Colorado in 1859, I think it was, here in Denver. Today we have a Denver Public School named for Owen Goldrick. How did Denver City get its start? right here in Apollo Hall. That's the frame building with the balcony on it in the middle of this photograph. It was also a theater. I put this flyer up to remind me to remind you that this was the theater where they actually were doing Shakespeare and other plays as early as the 18, late 1850s, early 1860s. But it's most significant perhaps is the birthplace of Denver City government. The folks had a few drinks in the bar down below, then went upstairs and created the people's government of the city of Denver. And what was the first thing they did? The people's government, build a new Bronco Stadium, build a new airport, new convention center. No, the very first thing was to elect Judge Lynch. And they put him to work trying to bring law and order to this town 700 miles away from the nearest jail. That site today, by the way, is Larimer Square. And here's Judge Lynch at work. He was elected to bring law and order uh, to Colorado Territory, and here he is. And according to the Rocky Mountain News, this guy, an Irishman, I think, who had stolen horses, was being hung on the Larimer Street Bridge. He was asked for his last request, and can you see it? It was for a smoke, not for a prayer or not to talk to, send a message back to his mother or his sweetheart or whatnot, but for one last smoke before he was, as the Rocky Mountain newspaper, the newspaper in those days, how many of you missed that newspaper as much as I did? The Rocky Mountain News reported that he was jerked to Jesus, which I thought was fairly charitable. He might have been jerked the other way. A great performance in early 1860s Denver was Mademoiselle Carlista. I hope all of you out there in the cave line can see her. 
walking across Larimer Street there up on a tightrope. And you can see half the town is gathered, but notice that where she might fall, nobody is there to catch her. She would fall right onto the dirt street of Larimer Street at that point. Uh, this attracted everybody in the territory to come watch her. She did this once in a while over Larimer Street and every night uh, back in the Criterion Saloon from a stage in front uh, to a balcony in back. She would entertain the miners this way. This is a, another of those dioramas that we mentioned that were done by the WPA in the 1930s at History Colorado. This is what's Larimer Square today. On the left, you can see uh, Cherry Creek. And then these buildings, some of which uh, replicas of them are standing today in Larimer Street. You can see that diorama, by the way, at History Colorado uh, to this day. Here's Larimer Street, and you look sharp here. I hope you can see the, uh, the tracks right along here of this first streetcar, which went up Larimer Street back in 1871 up to 16th Street, then across town on 16th. If you wonder why 16th is the mall today, the head, uh, head shopping district, it's because it dates from way back when the streetcar first went there, bringing customers to the shops. Here's the bridge in the foreground over Cherry Creek. The California Concert Hall, you might have seen right back there on the right, was one of the many amusement places. And be suspicious if you see a place that has to advertise that it's bright, clean, and refined. That should be a tip off that there's some question as to whether or not these uh, girls who work there were bright, clean, and refined. The California Concert Hall amused, uh, entertained many miners who came just to see a woman which in a woman's short territory of Colorado. Uh, Dennis Gallagher, some of you know, our former city auditor, Senator, uh, state, what was he, city auditor. He was the councilman. He was a state legislator, state representative, state senator from North Denver. This is his great grandfather's bar, Madden's Wet Goods. And Matten is the man there in the suspenders, looks a little bit like Dennis Gallagher uh, does today. And uh, I did my uh, PhD at Boulder and did a dissertation on the bars of Denver and had a lot of fun with the Mattens because the descendants are still around. Uh, some of them Irish, uh, not Catholic nuns and priests. And I gather that should be a reliable source. And they told me about Madden's Wet Goods at 1140 Larimer Street. The bar is now gone as part of the uh, Auraria campus. But Madden was the old fashioned politician who would walk the neighborhood, uh, greet you, uh, kiss the babies, give candy to the ladies. If you had a worthless son who was in trouble, he'd try to get him a job uh, with the city. And he apparently also took in the homeless uh, because I found in researching this place there were like 230 registered voters living in this little saloon. And those votes, of course, all came in handy on election day. Elections used to be a lot more fun, by the way. You got paid a dollar a beer to vote, and you could vote as many times as you wanted. Just change your name, and you'd be taken to another precinct and registered to vote there. Um, okay. What was the name of the uh, tightrope walker? Mademoiselle Carlista, who was also an actress, uh, Gabriel and quite famous as an entertainment in early Denver. Uh, next, we get to Larimer Street is Skid Row. It was once our main street with the city hall that you just saw on it, many other important buildings. Then in its decline, it turned into a place for the homeless, a problem, of course, which we still have with us very much uh, today. And here was the uh, Cops, rather cruelly, these guys had finally saved up enough money to buy a bottle of booze. And here is Officer Shalbrack, who had the Larimer Street Patrol emptying that into the gutter, much to the distress of these guys who finally saved enough money to buy a bottle. What's the answer to Skid Row? How do you clean it up? The solution was the Urban Renewal Authority, which erased block after block of downtown Denver, saving just a few 
uh, landmarks. But can some of you remember when it was just parking lots and empty lots down there before the high eruption of the high rises? As a, as a solution to urban problems, the idea then was to uh, make the city over again, make it look more like suburban shopping malls. Interestingly, today, of course, we have the opposite problem where the wealthy are returning to the city, the poorer folks and minorities are often forced out into the suburban uh, counties. But uh, for a while with the urban renewal, you saw the construction crane all over the city as you're still seeing today, as a matter of fact, of people building up on what had been empty lots in the original gold rush, uh, silver rush buildings of the, 18, of the 1800s. One woman to the rescue. One woman who has made a huge difference in Denver is Dana Crawford. You see her here with Mayor Kerrigan walking through what's now Larimer Square, trying to persuade the politicians to save one block from urban renewal, not to block, uh, to allow demolition of this oldest block in the city. Dana was a beautiful, attractive woman, very convincing, and she managed to save Larimer Square. And because Larimer Square was saved and succeeded as a business district, uh, Lodo, where Dana was also instrumental, has been saved. And uh, the Oxford Hotel, with flour mill lofts, a lot of other landmarks that Dana has been involved with. But without her, we wouldn't have a Larimer Square. We wouldn't have a Lodo. Uh, so she's played a huge role in the revitalization of downtown uh, Denver. And Larimer Square today, kind of the heart of the city, the place where people celebrate uh, when the Nuggets win. When, if the Rockies ever win, we'll celebrate them there too. And here's Dana uh, at the planning stage, restoring these buildings starting in uh, 1965. And today, kind of a vibrant heart of the city. Across the creek, our area neighborhood was not doing quite so well. It becomes industrial. As you can see from here, all the smoke, what had originally been residential, as Gabriel was telling us earlier, uh, becomes a industrial area with breweries and flour mills and other uh, offices and quite a few bars, I should add, in a poor neighborhood where Hispanics tend to celebrate. You can barely see Mount Evans in the background here uh, through the smog. St. Elizabeth's Church, that tall steeple there, is still there. It's landmark today and still actually an active uh, parish uh, on what's the Auraria campus today. All the other buildings there have been torn down, but St. Elizabeth, a designated landmark, is saved, along with a beautiful little Jewish synagogue there, uh, Temple Emmanuel, which is now serves as an art uh, gallery for the campus. Here's another shot of St. Elizabeth's. And the story about this is that when they were building this, it was mostly German Catholics involved here, uh, that they approached the, the biggest brewer in town in those days, the Zhang Brewing Company. And he said, sure, I'll give money to this. I'd like to put in the bell tower, but provided that you have that bell ring, Zhang, Zhang, not clang, clang, but Zhang, Zhang. And if any of you ever down there around Levin the Curtis on the Rary campus. Listen closely and you'll see here it's ringing, Zhang, Zhang, advertising the nearby Zhang Brewing Company. Of course, that's the story. Here is the St. Elizabeth School. Isn't this cute? All these little kids there. 1907 is the date on this. And you can see there a German Franciscan educating these immigrant kids at St. Elizabeth School now demolished, uh, but it was the first school on what's now the Auraria campus where there's a lot of other education going on today. And uh, St. Elizabeth still feeds the poor there. You can see a sandwich line if any of you are down that neighborhood around 11.15 on Monday and Thursday, you can get a free meal at St. Catherine's. I think some of our hungrier students uh, on the campus took advantage of this while they could. Here's the little synagogue I told you about, the Emmanuel Sharif Cemetery, Cemetery Synagogue. It was built as an Episcopal church uh, 
Emmanuel Episcopal Church, but later as Episcopalians moved to Capitol Hill and wealthier neighborhoods, uh, Russian Jews move in here, take it over and convert it to a synagogue. You can maybe see uh, some of the Jewish symbolism here. There's one of the few synagogues which has a Gothic look to it, Gothic arch windows and a rose window, but a great monument to the Jewish immigrants, many of whom settled in Auraria in West Denver. The paintings by Herndon Davis. Uh, here's restoration of that. It was saved 1977, landmarked and not demolished. The Star of David still stands up on top of the church. And if you could read it, it's a little hard to read in this photograph. There's a Hebrew inscription in gilded letters on the front door of there of this great uh, landmark. Okay. Another preserved landmark is the Tivoli Brewing Company. Tivoli, spelled backwards, means I love it. And many people did like their Tivoli Brewery. Uh, Max Melsheimer, a Jewish immigrant from Milwaukee, built that center tower as the uh, Milwaukee Brewery. It was later expanded and converted into the Tivoli Union Brewery. It's been preserved. And today there is, guess what? There's a brewery in there called the Tivoli Brewery, uses some of the old machinery, uses some of the old recipes. And you can now major on the campus with the help from the Tivoli and beer, the dream of many a young undergraduate male at any rate, I think, to major in beer. It's been stripped of its white paint. So today you see the original brickwork in the restoration uh, and the Mansard Tower is still very intact. Inside the Tivoli, it lasted through prohibition up until 1965 when some floods damaged the brewery, Platte River flood of 65. And after that, it never tasted the same. And shortly thereafter, as the Tivoli closed down, uh, was incorporated onto the campus as a student center and a, a bookstore and a restaurant. And as, and as I mentioned in the last decade or so, it's reopened as the Tivoli Brewery, a great brew pub. It's done so well, there's a branch of the Tivoli now out at DIA. Uh, this was what happened at the Tivoli. The whole neighborhood is taken down except for a few landmarks like the little synagogue in St. Elizabeth's and the Tivoli level to build the, what's the Rary campus today, the largest campus in the state with almost 50,000 students at uh, CU Denver, where I teach, uh, and Metropolitan State University of Denver, and the Community College of Denver. The idea here was to combine the three schools so they could share uh, many facilities like a swimming pool, and a bookstore, and whatnot, and provide much cheaper education than you could get at the University of Denver or CU Boulder, uh, get a good quality, high low cost education on the Rary campus once the buildings go up around the Tivoli. I gave the student, I think an A for this. He snuck through the brewery and got up to the very top of it, took a picture of the Rary campus. As you can see, everything wiped out there, waiting for these new buildings to slowly arise uh, on the Rary Higher Education Center. Uh, which enabled many people who could not afford a dormitory, who still lived at home uh, or had found cheap rent somewhere in Denver to go to school here. One block of older area, these little houses was saved as a monument to the early pioneers there uh, who settled in that neighborhood, the Germans, the Irish, the Jews, uh, later Hispanics moving in. Uh, saving St. Cajetan's Church, which you can see off there to the right, and some of these little old homes, which have been converted for uses on the campus. A reminder of the oldest neighborhood in Denver. Thanks, Gabe, for getting these up. And here are two of those houses before restoration. It's a great project, something like a million dollars spent to fix up these old historic homes, the oldest homes in the city. Uh, for conversion to campus uses. The Ninth Street Historic Park, it's called, 
an anchor of that is this, St. Cajun's uh, church with apologies to Vincent Van Gogh, don't you think? In his starry night there. This is the Mexican wedding there. And that beautiful Spanish style church, the first church built for Spanish speaking uh, folks in Denver. And still a now designated landmark celebrating Hispanic culture. The par parish has moved out to, I think it's Alameda and Raleigh out in Southwest Denver, but the building's been saved, used for educational uh, purposes. Um, do you know if uh, Golden Meir's home is on that block? Thank you, uh, Gabriel. You're absolutely right. It To save it from demolition, it was moved in, and it is uh, right next to the church, actually, Golden Meir's house, which is also now something of a museum of Jewish history and of the Jewish folks in that neighborhood. A little one-story bungalow, very modest place where she went to high school when she was in Denver. The of course, Golda Meir, as many of you know, was the first uh, female pr prime minister of Israel. One of my students, Magdalena Gallegos, did a great book and <coughs> article on St. Cajunus. This is a picture of her wedding there inside the church. And she said this church was an anchor for the Hispanic community. That there was also a health clinic connected to it, also a credit union an employment service. So many newcomers coming to Denver would go to this church and find a lot more of the spiritual help there, uh, help getting a business started, help getting a job, finding a place to live in this uh, new gringo town. Here's the campus slowly arising. And this is an early stage of it, but now there are many other buildings there. It's almost fully built out for something like close to uh, 50,000 students. Okay, Gabe, oh, here, here's another shot of the campus, constantly under construction. I've been in five different office buildings since I started out at a Rary way back in 18, 1970, 1977. And it's been fascinating to watch this campus uh, grow and offer that uh, affordable education to a lot of folks who otherwise would never get to college. One of the most interesting stories there is Casa Maya and this family who fled the Mexican Revolution, and the battles and struggles going on in Mexico. I bought this little house, rented it first, and saved enough money to buy it, converted to a, a, the Casa Mayan, the first Hispanic restaurant in Denver, which welcomed gringos. Usually Hispanic restaurants were for Mexicans, not for us gringos. But she made such great tortillas, everybody wanted those. And so they opened this restaurant and slowly expand this little house. And with the help of all their children, something like 11 kids, uh, offer food and drink there. They also did Mexican dance and did uh, Mexican music, musica. So it's something of a cultural center too. And a lot of uh, gringos would go there just to see these cute little kids helping out and hear the music and the dance at the Casa Maya. It has been preserved. And today is something of a, a museum to the Hispanic cultures there in Auraria. And that's uh, the, the uh, Gonzalez family there you see in the doorway. And I think this little Mexican restaurant did more to, to bridge that chasm between English speaking and Spanish speaking Denverites than any public agency or any other group that I can think of. Because once you went into these Mexican restaurants and had your first margarita, your first chili rano, your first tacos burritos, you felt a lot better about those people who earlier had been uh, alien and host hostile people that you didn't want to deal with. But the Mexican food, I think, bridged the gap and converted a lot of us to the Mexican culture uh, in some of its amenities. Are you getting hungry? I am. We're a little thirsty. This was one of the Jewish pioneers, the Grausman family. They lived upstairs and ran the little neighborhood grocery there. And there are fond stories of them, how they would extend credit uh, to the poor folks in the neighborhood. Would Safeway lend you credit, give you credit? or King Supers, I doubt it. Uh, but the Grossmans would, 
they lived here, worked here for quite a while. When Araria was condemned uh, for urban renewal authority, you can see some of the Hispanic residents wanted to stay there. They're protesting the demolition of Ninth Street and it worked. This building has been restored now. I think it's a coffee bar on uh, Ninth Street Park in, on the Araria campus with the pioneer Jewish clan involved. Here's what happens. Uh, Historic Denver manages to wrestle away this one block from the Urban Renewal Authority. They were demolishing everything else there and spend a million dollars on restoring one block, Ninth Street Historic Park, as a reminder of old Denver and of the neighborhood where Denver began. <coughs> Another view of that, and you can see St. Elizabeth's in the background, and this bit of green space, it's uh, one of the biggest bits of green space we on the, have on the campus there, and a great place for uh, students to gather, celebrate, whatnot. Gabriel mentioned the uh, Golda Meir house, and here it is. It was gonna be demolished over on West, on West Colfax uh, it's saved, moved to the campus there and restored as the Golden Meir House and something of a museum of the Jewish pioneers uh, who played a role in Araria and the rest of the city, of course. Araria also becomes, more modern history, a stop on light rail. This original line ran back in 1995 from Broadway and around Alameda up to the Araria campus. Students get free passes on the uh, light rail along with their tuition in the Araria. So we're training a whole generation of students now to ride light rail, just as your folks, some of you and some of your grandparents and parents rode light rail, these students are. And once they get used to that and not paying the huge parking fees you're paying downtown, being able to read or study on the bus while you're getting there, I think many of the next generation will be addicted to light rail, to mass transit, as you see here. And much of that story starting with the Auraria line. And interestingly, that was, if you remember where the first streetcar line was back in 1871, was on Larimer Street up to 16th Street and then across town on 16th. So we're rediscovering the past here, reinventing the solution that we had a hundred years ago to our transit problems. Ninth Street Park fully restored today. These beautiful Italianate housing, see that one with the cresting on it and the trim there are restored as a reminder of what Raria once looked like with St. Cadjitans there in the distance. Uh, here's another view of St. Cadjitans Church. Notice that it's that Spanish style, appropriate for this first Spanish speaking congregation, with a curvilinear parapet with the round windows, the Roman round, round windows, with the rose window there, uh, with the red tile roof, a monument in Hispanic architectural style. It, it is also, by the way, now a landmark and used for a uh, talks and classes and gatherings on the Auraria campus. And many of the newer buildings going up there. And it's an evening school for a lot of students that work during the day can go there classes at night. Also, I've taught Saturday classes there for years for students who again couldn't attend eight to five Monday through Friday. So it's a school offers many classes and you have the, the three institutions to pick some, the community college, the CU Denver or Metro uh, for practically any class or any type of education you want, you could find somewhere on this campus. And even today, there's more buildings in here than this one. This is a view you're on Spear Boulevard in the foreground. Uh, looking at the science building and the new uh, North Classroom building in our area today. The uh, North Classroom building 
where I've taught for years. Okay, uh, Gabe. Oh, and here is the Tivoli. You can hopefully you can see the tower there on the upper right hand upper left hand corner and a little courtyard in front of it. This has been the kind of the place where we hold graduations and ceremonies there. There's also an outdoor beer garden right in front of the Tivoli. So this is a very popular gathering spot now. And at the end of the day, or maybe even before classes, I hope not, but uh, you might have a drink there, this old style German uh, beer. And uh, CU Denver. Uh, uses this for many of their events with that wonderful Mansard Tower. And the restorations, you remember the earlier photographs, it was all painted white. They stripped the paint off and restored the bricks. I think this was like a $10 million restoration to make this the focal point, the, the proudest building on the campus is the brewery. Mm -hmm.